Well, there was a couple, and they were married for 60 years. Now, you have to admit, 60 years is truly a lifetime, isn't it? I mean, that's an accomplishment in itself. And one of the reasons that they were so successful is that they shared everything, and they loved each other deeply. But there was one rule that the wife had. When they got married, you see, she put a box up in the top corner on the shelf in the closet. And she asked her husband to never, ever look in that box and not to ask any questions about what was in that box. Well, through the years, he never asked, he never looked, and things were fine. Again, they loved each other deeply. They had a great relationship. Everything was on the table. Everything was open and honest. But one day, the wife came down with an illness, and it didn't look good. The doctors had done everything they can, could, but the husband began to put things in order and get her, all of her affairs uh, in order. I don't think I'm on, Barry. Yeah, I am. Okay. All right, so anyway, it just so happened that as he was putting her affairs in order, he remembered that box up in the corner on the shelf in the closet. And he asked his wife, hey, can we take that box down and, and look into it? I'm, I'm very curious about what's in that box. And so she agreed that that would be a good idea. So he brought it to the hospital and they opened the box and inside the box there were two crocheted dolls and a roll of money that totaled $95,000. Well, the wife explained to her husband that the day before they were married, her grandmother had given her some advice. She said, whenever possible, Make sure you work really hard to reconcile any differences that might come up in your marriage. Work together to work those things out that you're, you can't agree on or that cause conflict in your marriage and you'll lead a happy life. But if you can't do that, then what I want you to do is crochet a doll. And that's what she did. Every time they couldn't agree, she crocheted a doll. But as the man, the husband, heard the story, it, it just touched his heart so deeply. Tears began to run down his eyes, thinking that there were only two times in their entire 60-year marriage that they had ever come to a point where they couldn't work things out together, and she had knit and crocheted these two dolls. Well... Curiosity started to get the best of him, though, because that explained the dolls, but it didn't explain the $95,000. So the man asked, well, why is this roll of money here? What's this $95,000 all about? And the wife said, well, every time I crocheted a doll, I went down to the lo local craft market and sold it. Were you following me? All right, all right, all right. That's a delayed reaction. Well, hey, look, conflict is a part of life, right? We all know that we can't avoid it if we're in a close relationship with anybody or not so close even with our coworkers or even acquaintances, people that are driving down the road sometimes there's conflict as they don't do what we think they should be doing, right? They're not driving right. They don't use their signal. They, they're in the passing lane when they should be in the other lane. They're driving too slow, whatever it is. Or maybe you're one of those people that always seems to pick the line in the grocery store. You know, it says 10 items or less, but there's always that one person, right, with a cart full of stuff. And you have, you're in a hurry, and you have to get behind them. Conflicts happen in life. It's natural. Sometimes they're minor, like, you know, driving down the road or, or at the supermarket or at the workplace. Somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to do and it causes pressure for your job. Whatever it is, sometimes they're just misunderstandings. But other times, they can get pretty serious, can't they? 
sometimes they cause a rage and, and an anger that wells up inside us because our feelings are hurt. We feel disrespected. We feel discarded. We feel like this person has done us some type of injury. Then resentment builds up, doesn't it? And we start to hold grudges. In marriages, maybe it ends in divorce. In churches, maybe it ends up in a split. There's all kinds of repercussions when we don't deal with conflict effectively. And why does conflict happen in the first place? What's the real root behind it all? Well, I think there's some pretty simple answers why. We don't get what we want. People don't act the way we think they should act. They don't do what we think they should do. They don't say what we think they should say. Conflict happens because of our expectations a lot of times. You didn't act the way I, I wanted you to act. You didn't do what I wanted you to do. You didn't say what I wanted you to say. You know, uh, whenever I, I get with a couple and we do marriage counseling, one of the chapters that we go into pretty much in depth is dealing with conflict. Because sooner or later, in any relationship, there's going to be that time when, you know, things get rough and you don't see eye to eye, and that happens. There's a rub there. I always like to say, you know, everything's fine until my issues and your issues collide, right? Then there's a conflict. But in that chapter, we talk about the fact that not all conflict is actually bad. We know it's natural. It's a part of our lives. So in other words, if we deal with it the right way, it might be actually a good thing. In a marriage relationship, in a close relationship in our families, that could mean that there's a, a deeper intimacy that, it, that emerges from that time of working things out together, trying to understand one another's point of view. In our friendships, when we have conflict, as we talk things out, it can lead to a deepening of that relationship, a, a greater appreciation for another perspective, another point of view. Conflict could be a good thing. But the problem with conflict is that too many times we don't handle it the right way. We handle it negatively, destructively. And instead of growing closer together in our conflicts, it rips us apart. And as I said last week, sometimes it gets so bad that it's not just that the other person is wrong, but the other person is actually evil. Now, I don't, hope that, hopefully that doesn't happen in your marriage. Linda kind of chuckled. David, you ought to worry. Sleep with one eye open. Well, I think part of the, the reason that sometimes people deal with conflict negatively or destructively it's not only that we have these expectations, but we all are a product of not only our life experiences, but our personalities, right? Our lives are made up of, of who we are first and how we process things. But secondly, our experience, our life experience teaches us how to deal with conflict. And what's the first experience most of us have on how to live life? Where's it come from? Our parents, our family, right? We learn to deal with conflict by watching other people. Mainly, and most importantly, our parents. How did our parents deal with conflict? Well, they might have dealt with it in, in one of two ways, right? Now, there's people that kind of want to avoid conflict, right? They try to escape it. They withdraw. They isolate. They run away from it. They try to hide from it. 
They don't want to confront it. They deny that it e is even uh, a part of it. You know those kind of people. They're, they're the peacekeepers in the family. They might use humor. They might try to de deflect some things that, that take away from the conflict that's occurring. But they're afraid, really, to lift up their voice because of maybe they're going to be rejected. Maybe if they say something, that other person's not going to love them anymore. You know, I kind of can fall into that peacekeeping mode, that kind of escape thing. I, I don't really like to be in conflict. I try to avoid it. I try to minimize it. Sometimes I'll crack a joke if things get too tense. And then I reach that point finally when enough is enough. That's what the escapists do when they deal with and face conflict in their life. Now the other side, you probably know a lot of these people, they're the ones with the really short fuse. They fly off the handle at the simplest things. They've learned that to, if somebody threatens you, if somebody attacks you in a conflict, you fight. Red, white, let's fight. And you confront it with everything you have, every weapon in your arsenal to deal with the situation that's at hand. You want to strike back. And, you know, people that are the, the attackers, the, their idea of an outcome is not a resolution. It's all about the winning at any cost normally. And what does that do? That just tears the relationship down. On the one side, the escapist is afraid to raise their voice and to make their voice known and heard and that their voice matters. And on the other hand is the attack and, and the win-at-all-cost mentality. So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with if you're an escapist or if you're a, an attacker when you confront conflict? Well, it was obvious, as Matthew writes in his gospel, that he understood and Jesus understood that there would be conflict. It, specifically, Jesus is giving instructions, Matthew's giving instructions to the church. If somebody sins against you, go. And if it works out, then you've made a friend. If that doesn't work, take two or three as witnesses. If that doesn't work, bring it before the whole church. But I think we can also apply that to our lives, in our circumstances, when we are confronted with conflict in our lives. You know, I think there's a tendency, especially maybe by the attackers, but... I think maybe the escapists do it too because, you know, if you ever notice uh, what sins really bother you in life, they're the ones that, you know, they're maybe the bigger ones that you don't commit. You don't sin that way. You don't hurt people that way. You aren't lashing out in, in that manner. No, no, no. Their sin is much worse than my sin. The first thing we have to recognize is that we all have sinned and we all fall short. We all need a Savior. And that Savior teaches us an important thing. If we've all sinned and Jesus was willing to go to the cross uh, for those sins that they be forgiven to lead us into new life, then we ought to follow that, right? We ought to follow the example of Jesus Christ. You know, 1 John sums it up pretty good. And he says this. Starting in, uh, well, it's a, a weird version, and I'm not even going to try to read it because it's a mess. What he says is that God loved us, and we need to love one another. That's the new command that Jesus gives us. So instead of approaching someone that you're in conflict with, with the attack mode, or trying to avoid it, when you approach that person, we're to approach that person in love with the motivation 
to be reconciled with that person. You know, again, the attackers and uh, even, even the uh, escapists, when things get bad enough, what do we tend to do? We tend to magnify their sins and minimize our sin. We tend to go in there and, and if it's about winning the argument, what we do is we start to blame, or we say that big word, right? Well, I wouldn't do this except, or I wouldn't do this, but, that's the big word. If you didn't do that, I wouldn't. Our motivation makes a difference on how we approach the conflicts we have with one another. And we have to remember that we should approach those conflicts out of a love for one another out of the desire to be reconciled with one another. In fact, you can kind of test it out. Somebody, Bob Goff, uh, said it this way. The way we treat people we disagree with most is a report card on what we've learned about love. The goal isn't winning. The goal isn't denying the problem. The goal is going to that person that you're in conflict with, that you disagree with, with a heart filled with love. Are you going to that person with their best interest in mind or your best interest in mind? Are you going to win the argument? Are you going to be reconciled? Those are the questions we have to ask in this world. And Scripture tells us about that motivation, Proverbs especially. You know, King Solomon wrote it to his son, those little nuggets of wisdom. There's certain times you shouldn't go to that person that you're disagreeing with, that you're in conflict with. You shouldn't go to that person when you're angry, when you're not listening, when it's none of your business. How many of us are guilty of that one? When we're tempted to lie or tell a half-truth, when we feel critical, we shouldn't go ahead and confront someone or go to them when it's time simply to listen. And we shouldn't go to a person and try to resolve the conflict when we're tempted to just hurl insults. I didn't give you chapter and verse, but it's in the Proverbs, and one of those is taken from the book of James. Our motivation makes all the difference. Our words make all the difference. Well, as we wrap it up today, uh, we know that as Christians, we're to be governed by love. But in the pandemic, we've seen... And it's probably not caused by the pandemic so much as it's just something that's happening with the rise of social media, Snapchat, Instagram, all of that kind of garbage that's out there. If you're not careful, you're going to get sucked into and you're going to be finding yourself in conflict after conflict, disagreeing and debating people endlessly on social media. You look at our political situation and one side, liberal versus conservative. There's racial tensions. There's gender tensions. There's uh, class tensions. There's all these things that are going on that create all this conflict. And it, it seems like the social media platform just feeds into that. You know why it does that? It's, in fact, there's a study that they did that said or, or found that social media is affecting the way that we empathize with other people. They found that there's a lack of empathy in our culture. You know what empathy is, right? Being able to take on the perspective of another person, to walk in their shoes, to open your ears and listen before you open your mouth. And because of that lack of empathy, then there's a whole other thing that happens and occurs, and it's a dehumanization of other people. We no longer see people created in the image of God. 
We no longer see that person as special in God's eyes, unique. We just want to fight with them. We want to be in conflict with them. And the more we can dehumanize them, the better it is because then they're not even people anymore. They're just an object in which we can fight and debate. You know, sometimes it's important that we're selective in our, value, in our battles. Sometimes it's better to seek peace than always trying to be right. Matthew gives us a great example of how to handle conflict in our lives. Go to that person motivated by love and motivated to reconcile that relationship. Go to that person with a witness, not your allies that are going to beat that person up, but as witnesses. And if that doesn't work, take it, take it to others. What if we practice that instead of dehumanizing people, instead of attacking and thinking the end game is to win? How much would our lives change? How much would our world change? What if we really follow Jesus' example? Let's pray. Lord, we know that we are not always going to see eye to eye with one another, our neighbors, our friends, our our family members, our, our loved ones, that there'll be conflict that happens in life. But Lord, lead us and teach us and guide us through your wisdom, through your word on how to handle it so that it's not just another broken relationship in life, but there's an opportunity to reconcile, to understand, to empathize, to see the world and those people that we disagree with through the eyes of Jesus. Lord, help us. Help us to be united, not divided. Help us to listen and not be so quick to think. Lord, transform our lives to witness to your love in this world and in our relationships. It's in your name we pray. Amen.